It's Crucible Radio with Mega Giveaways, Power Weapons, Keenan Thompson, Map Control, Rachel Dredge, Horatio Sands, Snack Dads, and Maya Rudolph. Featuring musical guest Second Go and your host. Famous birds, bones, and sweet stash. Well, hello, boys. That was a fun intro to record. Oh, yes, it was. We didn't spend 15 minutes writing it. (laughs) (laughs) It just spontaneously happened. Yeah. Everyone said their lines perfectly, handed off perfectly. We didn't even plan out who's going to say what. Definitely did not do more than one take. But it's all over now. I hope you enjoyed it. But on with the show, and the show is, of course, Crucible Radio, your show for all things Destiny 2 PvP. Hi, boys. Hello, birds. Hi. Hey, Bones. Hey, Swain. Man, it's, it's, as always, it's been a, been a pretty awesome week. D2's in full swing, everyone. We are in it. We are all sorts of ready to talk about some Destiny. Uh, but first, we wanted to reach out to all y'all and ask you if you could leave us an iTunes review or Stitcher or whatever podcast application you use to leave reviews and to listen to our show. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you just left uh, five stars. Is that how everybody rate, rates podcasts nowadays? Stars? I think so. It's five stars. Or no, five stars, right? I love so uh, I, I also wanted to read one. Uh, there's definitely one I wanted to read by Robbie Vallone that I, is way too long. Way too long for the show, but uh, <laughs> I'll just go with uh, this one by Ginger Jesus. <laughs> this is titled, okay. These Boys. These dudes say words. I like the words they say. Also, I just met them for the second time at Guardian Con, and they remembered me from the previous <laughs> year. Good dudes with good insight into the crucible. I'll take it. Well, thank you, Ginger Jesus. I appreciate Thanks so it. so much. But everyone... Head on over, read Robbie Valone's, and while you're there, leave, a, <laughs> leave us a review. We'd appreciate it. Be funny. I like funny reviews. We'll read you <laughs> on the show. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love the inclusion of this bit. <laughs> oh, man, this is a, a D2 time to be playing. We got, we got so much to talk about on the show this week. Uh, we've actually already recorded the interview. I love this interview so much. Even if you hate us, you're just here for the giveaway. You should skip ahead and listen to us talk to the one and only Joe Verrated, Mr. Joe himself. Such a fun chat. We got some other f- fun stuff, but hey, uh, let's give some sweet gear away. How about that? I'm down. Yeah. We're going to be doing giveaways for the next three weeks. You can still sign up, although you cannot be eligible to win a special bundle of Crucible Radio gear from our new store. We're talking a shirt, a hat, a mug, a hoodie, whatever you want, because we're going to give it away right now. I have closed the entries. Boys, it is time to select a winner. Are you ready? I'm ready. Should I hit a drum roll? Yeah, we're going to need a... Or cut Swain's out and put in a real one, Andrew. Swain's got to work on his rudiments, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've got a system. This is not the most. Um, this is not the most elegant system, but it is random and it works. We edit and everything going, else, but we're not going to edit how we <laughs> we drew <laughs> who won. Drum roll, please. It is lucky number three fifty is going to be taking this one. We're up to two hundred. We're up to two hundred one. Two fifty one. Lucky number 350 is Noah M. from Scottsdale, Arizona. Congratulations. You are the winner. We're going to be emailing you. Okay. Well, so here's the thing. We, uh, we didn't want to necessarily say your last name on the show, blow it up. You know, people have their private lives. I certainly wouldn't appreciate it. So we're going to go with Noah M. touch. Sorry if there's other Noah M's that got their hopes up. We just added the Scottsdale, Arizona bit. But Noah, I feel like you're listening to this and you know it's you. We're going to send you an email as soon as the episode drops. 
And uh, you are going to have a wild and crazy shopping spree in the Crucible Radio store. Maybe pick up a Voop hat. Maybe pick up a Bird's Monarchy mug. Who knows? Well, when we were putting the giveaway together, we uh, wanted to have a hard deadline. Make sure everybody got in. Uh, but we also want to extend your entry ability. So if you still want to win and you are just listening and you're like, oh, man, I'm bummed I didn't get to reach the deadline. Well, they're extending it. If you want a shot at winning a custom scuff controller or a gaming monitor. We will still be doing those giveaways next week and the following week for those things. So get your entries in. We are still accepting them. Go to crucibleradio.com slash giveaway. And if you've already submitted, just sit tight. Next week we'll be giving away another cool prize. Tune in. Woo! All right, guys. Well, Enough fun stuff. Let's get into the most fun thing of all, Destiny 2. <laughs> oh boy. You guys having fun, man? What, what have you been up to this week? The, the grind is still active. There's still lots to do. What, what's been keeping you guys busy? Well, I did get my butt in the raid, and I feel good about that, and it was a lot of fun, I gotta say. But, you know, maybe we'll save that for a PvE episode. In terms of Crucible, I am I'm finding myself, guys. <laughs> Uh, it's really happening. And I think I just have the thing I like to use and I keep switching and I keep going back to it. And to me, that feels awesome as someone who never mains anything. It's awesome. I'm curious. What is it? Well, there's all this hype about devour void walkers and arc buddies on storm callers. And yeah, both of those are awesome and fun, but I love Dawnblade. I do. It's just so it's satisfying. I just, it feels good. It feels like me. I can play at a pace. I feel good with. Uh, the the synergy of both skill trees are so fun, and I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to see. I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna switch as soon as we stop recording. But I'm a, I'm a Dawnblade main main. I'm a Dawnblade main. How about this, Damn. Bones? If I see you on anything else, I'll give you shit for it. Hey man, I'm still grinding up those powerful nope. engrams. No, nope. still Dawnblade practicing. Main. Dawnblade main. <laughs> right. Dawnblade main. I, I mean, I think you, you've got an angle here. There's not a lot of Dawnblade mains out there, and there's a lot of perks that people maybe have not figured out the utility for. I have watched you do whatever that fancy drop is where you just, like, the Phoenix zoom dive. St- Phoenix dive straight down behind cover. That is a pro move right there. It's so nice. Dude, I used it all weekend on Eternity for Trials because I could check on defense – whether or not they came to keyhole because I could see over that box where everyone sneaks in that little hallway. So I'd float up, sit way up in the air. I'd have that angle and they'd always kind of like look up earlier than they expected because there's a warlock in the sky and I'd drop right back down and I can even bail and go back to temple if there wasn't anyone there. Or I could get that call out before my team even has a sight line, which was really helpful. So just little things like that. I break, I break eye line. Uh, he, he, Enemy tucks behind a wall. They're kind of half. I'm kind of half health. Float up for a little bit and drop down. When we re-engage, I've got like 40% more health that they didn't expect. And I win a lot of duels like that. It really, it's really fun. Nice. And then in PVE, I can just jump off of really tall things and fall quickly and not die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a plus. Swain, what about you? What have I been maining or just doing? <laughs> what are you up to, man? D2, talk about it. Swain time. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just grinding out the various things. I started my Warlock this week, which mm-hmm. is like really weird for me after I have played so much Titan at the end of Destiny 1 um, to go back to Warlock. The, the, the jump is so tough, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm getting I'm getting there. I've, I've definitely fallen off a lot of things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lots of uh, unintended deaths. But uh, it's fun. It's fun so far. I uh, I have also been dawn blading it, uh, but not not necessarily as much as I'm sure you have bones. But I'm getting there one mm-hmm. by one. Uh, it's definitely a grind to get through the story again, which is nice. Uh, you get to kind of re-experience everything that you kind of. It was all just a blur at the beginning. So seeing it again through the eyes of a warlock is nice. Definitely. But did that, did the raid, doing all sorts of nightfall activities with my clan. Sway Norbit. Been awesome. Uh, yeah, it's been a nice week. Birds, what about you? 
I feel like I've been doing a lot of different things. So I'm just going to go down the list. I changed up my loadout. I've been using Call to Serve, Prosecutor, and I actually switched over to Retro Futurist because I've got the trial shader on all of them now, and they look great together. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I was surprised at just how much your play style is forced to change when you have a scout rifle. Oh my God, it's so different. Like that working the angles, team shotting thing is mm-hmm. so much more prevalent when you choose that as your primary versus giving yourself in-air mobile weapons um. Yeah, and and realizing that if you don't like, you don't want to play that playstyle. Just don't don't use a scout. Use a use a gun that's going to get you all jumpy. That was fun. I mentioned it last week. I've been loving Way of the Wind on Arc Strider, especially on some of these bigger maps. It is it is so much fun and a lot more useful than the the fun melee stuff of the other Arc Strider path, which I thought I'd use more, and I actually don't take advantage of all that much because I usually die when I get that close to someone. <laughs> I also started my Titan, a lot of fun story missions there, but I decided that I was going to play the minimal amount of PV and just do all of my grinding in the crucible. It is so much fun. I, this, this tip from true Vanguard, that white pariah, that first auto rifle you get is so solid. And there's something so satisfying about melting someone with 300 power with a white weapon (laughs) because that's all you have. And uh, Striker is awesome. I really love the Titan movement. It feels so good. I love the new jump. And I feel like even though skating doesn't work, there are there's a lot of options still to be had with that jump when you're trying to shift momentum. The other thing, and I'll just mention this real quick, the Rapid Fire Viced Energy Autos. So this is going to be the Valakaden and the I think the Sand Wasp is the rare version of it. Valakaden is uh, this week's gear... Uh, I don't know how to say it. On Bungie's website, they're they're showing off that specific auto rifle. Yeah, that's because it's awesome. Like, I don't think it's the meta. I think you're still better off with, like, a a, a Uriel's archetype, one of the many fine choices there. But they've got such big magazines. They shoot so fast. Um, They're they're great at close range, and they're just a ton of fun. And I'm... I love the feist weapons. They're so nice. They're so nice. And it freaked me out when I got my, what's the Titan exotic? It's the chest, the Actium War rig that refills your auto rifle. That spooked me when I tried to reload and instead it just jumped up. And I was like, what? I, I, I just instantly reloaded. How did I do that? And I realized I was shooting a little bit and then it was auto filling right as I was pressing the button. (laughs) I I do want to take a second to say that that those like refill things are something I'm having a lot of trouble adjusting to. I'm sure yeah. it'll take some time, but like the sliding and getting ammo back, that's so nice on the trials weapons. Having the exotics that reload or refill like uh, peacekeepers with SMGs, mm-hmm. uh, the Actium War Rig for auto rifles. There's a lot of nice exotics that just kind of do the work for you. And I just recently picked up the Luna Faction boots for the Warlock and it makes the Rift uh, a reload pad. And it works for the user and it works for everyone on your team. All you have to do is sort of step onto it and you can empty a clip and just hop off, hop back on. And I practiced a little bit in the raid and it's really weird to just clip of clip after clip of better devils and and not reload at once. It's like your habit just wants you to to reload, uh, but it's, it's really effective. And I, I imagine it could save some skins in PVP on the occasion. I have a hot take, guys. Hey, yo, CR, can you throw me a hot take? Hot Hot take. I think the vast majority of people in PvP are not playing their perks. That these subclasses have got so many powerful perks and perk combos, these exotics that that reload your weapons, that change your mobility, that except for the really obvious standalone stuff, no one is really taking advantage of it with a couple exceptions like Devour that are just super popular and on mm-hmm. everyone's radar. And that there's still so many play styles that have not not even been touched on because like people forget that they've got three other perks in their in their path that just don't don't occur to them to to really try and play towards versus having, you know, like getting your precision precision damage boost and going, oh, well, that's nice. I, I forgot I had that. Um, I don't know. Is is that hot? It felt hot when I was I thinking think, it. I hot think you're take. absolutely right. I think 
You know, for me, I'll take an example is I'll put on an exotic that just sort of does what it does and I don't have to think about it because I'm really just focused on remembering that I have Icarus Dash if I'm not using Phoenix Dive. Like, it is hard to remember that, especially when you're like me who switches around a lot. So to to just put on Void Walker and think, okay, Devour, it's different than the Grenade Charge perk, so I got to use in this situation. Like, it's tough. You need a lot of playtime to just have that become second nature so it also makes sense to throw on an exotic like eye of another world where it's just like yeah yeah yeah, cooldowns thanks great yep they don't have to think about it so to use those uh exotics that have mechanics on top of you know getting those other mechanics ingrained i mean shout out to the players who have leveled up one skill tree and that's all they've used they're probably at that point but i think i think you're correct most people are not hot take hot take so uh so um you guys uh you guys see the twab this week Huh? Okay, yeah, got a little, uh, got a little twop this week. You got a, uh, you see the, uh, the papers? Got a little twop in my week right here. Yeah, yeah. Do you hear this? Uh, there's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be uh, factions in the back alleys. You hear that? <laughs> uh, I did. Also, can I just say this? Uh, dead orbit warlock helmet is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's really? that. Uh, it's that's that- the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. <laughs> In my entire fucking life, Swain, why have that little bit of scaffolding out front? What does it do? Why bother? I don't get it. There's a hot take. But anyways, (laughs) boys, our faction rivalries are finally appearing. This doesn't really pertain to PvP uh, or or anything, but it it, it pertains to us. Because we have, of course, split off into the three factions of Bird's Monarchy, Swain Orbit, and Future War Bones. And the faction rallies are here, and it turns out all of Destiny will be competing. Um, so go out there and rep your best faction. Obviously, it's Future War Cult. Mm. Uh, I'm interested to see how this plays out. It seems kind of so, cool, and it seems like a very active reason to to jump in and actually support Orbit, a faction. Totally going to win. Sorry, guys. Uh, We're the most we'll popular. <sighs> I... I, I, I'm torn because um, I am the proud leader of Bird's Monarchy. Hi, boys. And looking at all of it, like, I genuinely like the new Monarchy gear the most. I think the armor looks best. I could see myself wearing it. There's some cool guns there. Yeah. I just want your helmet. Can you just give me the helmet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want that, helmet. You, that want, helmet. you want those? Look at those arms, man. Look at those giant oh, no, no, The arms are the kettles. same arms as the raid ones, so I'll be fine. Just give me the helmet. I'll take the helmet. Thanks. And goodbye. Well, spoiler alert. Um, and it's crazy to me the, the way they're doing this. You where know, it's, it's probably, it's probably going to be the Iron Banner helmet. So, you know what? I'll wait. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess Swain's fine. Um, and that's probably for the best because there will only be one faction winner. And I love this idea that like they're actually making in-world game decisions based off of things the players do like in the real world. Um, but New Monarchy is probably not going to win. I, I understand that. It doesn't have the same Zazabiel. Bird's Monarchy off the chart. New Monarchy. I, I, I get Guys, it. and your, okay. your triple wreck leader over at <laughs> New Monarchy. <laughs> it, looks, it looks just like triple wreck. It, it has. He's always looked like triple wreck. I don't, yeah. Well, a rock Jalal just looking full on hot topic these days. Yeah. Yeah. Say something bad about Lakshmi. She seems nice. She's a robot. I like her. That's what I thought. <laughs> Can't trust the robot. I just, all these weapons, man, I want, I want all of them. I think I ha- I have to agree that the future war cult weapons probably look like the ones that you're just going to hold on to. Like we've already got the, the numbers, right? Which is mm-hmm. the auto rifle and can confirm it is dope. And then they've, they've got what the hand cannon, the scout and, uh, sniper, rifle. This, sniper rifle. And that's, uh, uh I don't I don't know if you guys caught this today, but I just learned that kinetic weapons point left and energy weapons point right. Whoa. Whoa. Game changer. So we Whoa. know that that is going to be a better devil's style hand cannon freaky deaky. But I, I have to admit the dead orbit weapons look pretty cool. I'm not into the new, new monarchy weapons at all. They're busted up, man. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, you can put shaders on them, right? I'm going to have to, uh, but but even just like the weapon types <laughs> of the families we're getting, I'm I'm not real through. That looks like one of those slug shotguns, which no thank. Well, hey, if you have been hearing about all these awesome clan rewards and you're looking to join a clan, well, first come to the Crucible Radio Discord. 
discord.gg slash slash crucible radio blah and then yeah. go to the we, we abandoned thread. ship on slack way long ago we are now on discord slack is dead uh and then check announcements and we've got a little description you can join our individual discords and join a clan if you want but anyways guys can we talk about well hold on can i can i make one very specific plug for birds monarchy i uh, guess everyone who joins birds monarchy gets a custom emoji I am an emoji factory. I'm cranking these things out using stolen internet art and a free version of Photoshop. I don't care. It's fun. Join Birds Monarchy. <laughs> we, uh, we're also really good at Destiny, so there's that too. Yeah, we just win. All we do is win, win. Okay. <sighs> Back to some Destiny. I know that I've been talking about using my Warlock a little bit more, uh, and I will tell you what has helped is this new set of control freaks that I actually got. Oh, you got some um, new ones? Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, control freaks actually sent them to me special. Uh, they are the Atomic Control Freaks. I'm, here, I got the box right here. It's, uh, it's got this... <laughs> Show <laughs> us! <laughs> here, look at this box. Uh, <laughs> it, no, it's, it's really cool. It's, uh, it's got, like, biohazard tape all over it, and they gave me, uh, those Atomic, like, candies... There you, can hear. <laughs> yeah. there you go. There's the audio bits. Yeah, no, these are the, the atomic fireballs, but the control freaks are actually really cool. Um, they've got like the, the tox- toxic biohazard symbol on them. They're nice and rough, which I really like uh, in my control freaks. And they aren't too tall, which is also something I like when I use. I use it with with my scuff as the right thumbstick to get a little bit of better aim. And uh, before I was using the Galaxy ones, I really like these Atomic Control Freaks. So head on over to controlfreaks.com and get yourself 10% off with offer code CRUCIBLE. These are awesome, and I highly highly suggest them. Uh, And we're actually going to give a pair of these away to the person who won our contest this week. Congratulations, Noah. Hope you enjoy them. I've been using the the D1 classic set on my right thumb stick and uh, it just helps just makes it easier to aim can't beat it. Yeah, especially now that fusion rifles are hit scan. Yeah. Uh-huh. What was that? Hmm? Hmm? <gasps> what um yeah. What? Hit scan. <laughs> scan. <laughs> well, speaking of fusion rifles, let's talk about power ammo. Guys, I don't know if you know But it turns out in the Crucible, they have this special type of ammo, only comes up so often, only available in a couple places on the map. Tell me more. (laughs) uh, Well, I will tell you more. It refills the ammo for your power weapon. You're probably wondering, how do I use this shotgun or fusion rifle, a.k.a. voot machine, a.k.a. fusion rifle, because we're not going to call them voot machines. And what's interesting is that we all... I was kind of surprised. We all played the beta. We all learned the power ammo locations. We started playing the real game. We ran to those same spots and realized, oh, they're not there anymore. Oh, or they're there sometimes? How does it work? It turns out that the power ammo locations are often different on different game modes. And that you really, I found personally, I benefit quite a bit from really taking a moment to pay attention to what game mode we're playing, think about the map. Uh, maybe consult one of our call-out maps. Um, you guys have got to check these out. If you go to crucibleradio.com and scroll down a little bit, we've got all the maps from our Crucible Radio cartographer Relict. Check them out on Twitter at Relict with a three and an L and a K and a T. Uh, check them out. We're going to be tweeting this stuff out. But he actually lists out all of the different power ammo locations for all of the different game modes. And this has been helpful for me um, because it turns out power ammo wins games. Oh my god! It it the, the when you go up against a team that, especially in a non-objective mode like Clash, where you really don't have to stay in any one place in the map, when you go up against a team that effectively controls power ammo, they just snowball in a way that <laughs> makes it really hard to play against. Um, especially considering that you don't necessarily know if they're going to be looking down a sniper, they're going to be trying to close the gap with a shotgun, they're hiding around a corner with a sword. Um, and and that I, I think as we're starting to get comfortable, it's really important to learn the locations of these power ammos and, and even consider sort of 
fitting your game style, sort of your your pacing and your your positioning around being ready to pick these power ammo boxes up and um, yeah, go on a tear, see if you can get four kills with them. I find it can be really tough to actually control it if you're not thinking about it a little bit in advance. I mean, obviously purple is up. You see how far you are from it, wherever you are on the map, but that's not quite all it requires, right? Like you need to actually think about when it's coming up and and the best way to do that is to actually check it if you're nearby. Take one second, walk over, aim, whatever it pops up the little distance counter and go, okay, 40 seconds on this. I'm actually going to start thinking about that. Yeah, you're not going to like stay within 10 feet for 40 seconds. That's not very helpful. But you can certainly try to count that in your head or maybe check again in 20 seconds and see where you're at. And and that does it goes a long way. It goes a long way. And it's really, really hard to do in stuff like quick play where you just sort of lose track of that sort of thing. I find that on a lot of maps that and depending on game mode, sometimes you get three, but usually there's two power ammo locations and they're set up in a way that sort of defines a hot area of the map. So uh, Midtown, for example, um, if you're playing Clash, uh, you do have three. So you do have the third box on on, on the low street. Um, but then you also have one inside the maintenance, that little sort of jump up near the spawn um, and then another uh, on the side of the uh, the lounge. Um, but those two spots in particular, granted, you've got a big showdown area in between them, but that really kind of defines a hot spot around the map. Um, and that for a, a lot of game modes, like Endless Veil and Control, um, there's there's generally sort of, they're placed close enough together that if you sort of time that drop going well, it's not difficult especially against a team that wasn't planning for it to safely pick up one and make a, a good chance to pick up the other, or at least cover a teammate to pick up that second box. And when you can control both of those um, and it's not just picking them up for yourself, but also denying them to the enemy team, mm-hmm. um, you can really do a lot of work. I mean, it, it seems like an obvious statement, uh, but I just realized a difference in my play when I actually started caring about the timer and started to try and think about positioning preemptively instead of just chasing my opponents to the end of the earth. I feel like this topic is going to force us to discuss this, but also like be realistic with your teammates. You know, you can get a <laughs> lot of power ammo one game. It, it, truly, it's fine. Like there are times where uh, I, I just feel like I'm making good pushes with an SMG and I don't need to hang back and pick up sniper ammo. It, I'm, it's working right now and I want to keep the pressure on the team. So I'll let my teammates grab power. But like, don't force it too hard if there's someone nearby or if you see them sprinting for it as well. Because let's face it, do you really want to just like be the guy with your grenade launcher the whole <laughs> game or do you want to win this thing and get back in it? I also had a moment recently in a game where I had power ammo and we were rotating and made it to the other power ammo box and it was still up. Mm-hmm. And I got there first and I was like, you know what? And I like kind of did like this motion in game, like to the guy that was like a little bit behind me, like you get it. Like if this is your, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like if we split it, if we split this up, there's more of a chance of us winning if more of us have power ammo. So that's like the, the crucible version of like holding the door open for the stranger who's walking behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, buddy. Even nicer. I've got, um, I think I've got three, and these these are not big things, but three small power ammo related tips uh, that I believe in strongly that are not necessarily intuitive. My favorite one I actually learned from our guest later in the show, Mr. Joe Verrated. You can push people off the power ammo block. You can slide into them and boop them out of the way and steal the power ammo, which is a crummy thing to do to your teammate. Yeah, but don't do that. You can do it if you want to. It's you know what he, funny. You know what you can also do is you can shoot someone while they're trying to pick it up on the enemy team and deny it. So you know how effective throwing a solar grenade on the power ammo is like maybe you don't even get a kill or anything like that. But that's worth a grenade because you prevent that guy from picking up a shotgun and going on a five, four or five kill streak after that. Uh, here's one. I'm, I'm not quite sure where I stand on it. Um because there have been a lot of times where I was making kind of a Hail Mary to try and pick up power ammo when I was 
putting myself out of position in the process, knowing, all right, I'm going to go off on all these guys the moment I pick this up. And then they shoot me as I'm trying to pick it up and I never end up picking it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that being said, I think it's still worth it to die with power ammo, even if you didn't use it and you had no better option to escape just to deny the enemy team that to, to if your team can pick up the other one or the other two and you can totally shut them out so you know that your shotguns or your fusions can really go unchallenged um, that if, if you're playing with a team that can take advantage of it it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to to die and um, and deny them power ammo in the process yeah I mean that's that's an old d1 habit right like throw yourself at the heavy ammo drop a nova bomb just slide in pick it up right but right as you get team shot to death and that that is a game game shift and and maybe you might think in d2 oh well it doesn't influence the game as much because there's not as many six people can't get it but it does a lot because like you're just saying going uncontested with a shotgun in in d2 is an incredible thing it's always such a great feeling when you pick up like five fusion rounds and you get kills with all of them because that (laughs) means you wiped them and then somebody respawned and you killed them too yeah (sighs) all right i'm gonna throw this last one out there um and it is a combination of okay you you've selected a particular type of power weapon uh consider your engagement distance and the correlate of that even if you have power ammo you don't need to have your power weapon out and this was something i had to stomach once i went through all my shotguns and decided retro futurist was the one for me (laughs) Because when I had a sword, the moment I got that power ammo, it was quick fang time. I'm going to be crouching. I'm going to be hiding. I'm going to be taking advantage of the third person camera to peek and to um, to have fun with it. Oh, birds. Uh, <laughs> I, I do want to say that I watched gigs from Tier 1 the other morning mm-hmm. for about a good hour or so as I was getting ready for the gym. But uh, he is taking that to a level I am pretty sure you're you're not even at yet. With oh, the quick thing, uh, he goes everywhere in third person mode. And because quick thing has that quick, like redraw back to your weapons, mm-hmm. you can use it so much more effectively. And you were, he was just like running around peeking corners and fi- like still going pretty like slowly and moving methodical with it. But it was so nice to watch someone that was like really good at it. Yeah, I, I, I can accept I will be forever forgotten as someone who liked Quick Fang, but I think I might have liked it loudest first, and I'll take that. <laughs> um, no, yeah, uh, it makes me excited for PC to have control over field of view because that extended field of view is it is incredible. What the just the amount of information you get back. Um, but when I finally set down Quick Fang and picked out a shotgun. It was difficult for me to get used to the idea of, okay, this shotgun's going to do great work over there, but between here and there is a, a risky series of long angles that I need to be able to fight at, and I can't mm-hmm. have my shotgun out. That for a lot of, not for a couple power weapons, I'm thinking in particular sniper rifles and shotguns where you're really at the extreme ends of the engagement range that it can usually be better to switch to your energy weapon, switch to your, your primary and really don't pull your power weapon out until you're in the right position to take advantage from it. And the downside of that means that I often die without firing a single shotgun round, but I tell myself that's okay because I could have died anyways. At least this way I was able to get some kills along the way as I was getting in the position because I had the right gun out. Um, but man, that's that's tough when you got shotgun shells burning a hole in your pocket to not just <laughs> jump up in the air, close the gap <laughs> across the open lane. Too dangerous. It takes a minute to get to the middle where it's all it's all chewy. Chewy. Yeah, close range. Chewy. Yeah, sure. So here's a question I have about power weapons and map control. I thought about this in my head just now, and I sort of had the answer that all power weapons do this. Uh, that being encourage flanking i'm thinking yeah a power weapon gives you huge advantage great time to flank when you can get those fast instant kills but i'm wondering if there's any power weapons that really do encourage to kind of hit the front lines direct on 
And I'm sort of thinking that a sniper flanking can be huge, but it's also nice to know you're not the only person being shot at when you're sniping because you can kind of avoid the recoil, recoil and get a body shot to help team shot shotguns. Maybe you just want to be up in the front. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you tend to split off when you pick certain things up or are there some where you're just like ready for the fight? If you're doing it smart, you're, you're like, like Bert said, you're not running into, into the chew. (laughs) Yeah. You're not getting chewed up and you're not, you know, forcing plays. You're trying to find the best angle to uh, utilize your power weapon. I'm going to say for me, that completely depends on what type of power weapon I'm using. If I'm using a fusion, especially one of the faster fusions, I am much more comfortable going off on my own because I know as long as I can reduce people down to a 1v1 angle, I'm going to be fine. Uh, With shotguns, I usually want a little flank, so like the quick reposition and just take the, the, the short route around to try and get them as they're falling back. With swords, I 100% want my team with me. I want them to be the distraction so I can get in a position. I'm crouching. I'm off radar. Hopefully they've never seen me and get them into some gun battle that's going to take away their radar and take away their focus and then do whatever it takes to quickly get around to the side and chop, chop, chop. I don't really snipe. And I don't know what you're supposed to be doing with grenade launchers. Not saying they're bad. I just don't know what to do with them. Uh, I guess it depends. Yeah, it also depends who you're playing with and what game mode you're playing with because sometimes your blueberries, and I, I noticed this, like blueberries are starting to stick together. Like people are being forced to learn the team shot and I see complete strangers just grouping up together and having a good default that can go up against four sets now in a way that wasn't really happening in the first week. Sometimes you have a team like that where you really can trust that you can flank by yourself And sometimes you just have human shields and you kind of need them to do their thing and die in front of you. So you can, uh, you can, you can get the angle that you need. I don't know. Good question. Well, you know, I kind of, we do, we do ask this uh, to Joey later on in this episode, but uh, did you guys notice anything about your decisions around power ammo in trials? Did it differ from quick play at all? I found the sword was not doing any work in trials for me and it was sad to give it up um <laughs> and with maybe, that freaking claymore jumping around <laughs> i mean that which was awesome <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i'm sure it's going to be different on different maps um this one nothing doing yeah and i think that was that was probably my 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 biggest regret about the trials i've played so far was being too locked into a loadout a set of guns that i felt had an identity for me when really that wasn't what the particular map in the game mode needed. Definitely, yeah, f- by the end was f- feeling feeling a shotgun, feeling a fusion rifle. <sighs> I'm, try- I'm, I'm going to spend a lot more time with uh, linear fusion rifles this weekend, I think. I was using them in the raid. They're great in the raid. Just for fun? Yeah, we'll see. I spent a lot of time at the end of D1 with Queensbreakers, so it's not foreign to me. And I just right. got the the Man of War, which is the quest uh, linear fusion rifle that you get on IO. You know, I was looking at the difference between Man of War and Tarantula, which is the one that we got to use in the beta. And they both seem fine. They're both very close uh, statistically, same charge time and everything. But the Man of War offers increased movement speed and target acquisition when moving while aiming down sights. And I did mm-hmm. kind of like that because of that long charge time. I feel like I'm going to aim beforehand. But to, to compare, the Tarantula has snapshot, essentially. And uh, it's an interesting choice because some people like to do that charge and then aim. And maybe snapshot could help. But I don't know. I'm leaning Man of War. I'll, I'll say Man of War simply because uh, that target acquisition bones, you can mm-hmm. feel it. It's one of yeah. the stickiest, like... There there was moments where I'd be using it and it would be like, oh, my God, that guy just like a guy would run by and you'd feel it drag with the with the person. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. Yeah, it's a it's a decent it's it's probably the better of the two simply because it it'll be really easy. Almost Queensbreakers like to get those headshots. Interesting. Well, still on the lookout for the, the Queensbreakers of D2. But uh, no, it's, maybe it's, it's, it's already here. It's Man Quest. Okay. It's do the okay. quest on Aya. I no, I got it. I got it. I just haven't used it yet. Use it. Do do it, birds. Come on. 
All right, I'll start using this gun in the crucible. What do you stop, want from me? Stop acting like a little boy. <laughs> I'll have you know, I'm the luckiest boy in the world, but not as lucky as our uh, delightful interview guest, who we are going to talk to in just a sec. But before we do that, we've got to give a shout out to our sponsor this week, Audible. Thank you, Audible. I love Audible. I started it because of Audible on this show, and it's been awesome. So the one thing that I, I didn't realize about Audible is they have so much more than just audiobooks. They have original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers. Little tidbits, there's small stuff, there's big stuff, like even like magazine articles. It's great. And unlike a streaming or a rental service with Audible, you own your books. So you can access them anytime, anywhere, from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets, Windows Phone, or right on your PC. Plus, thanks to the Great Listen Guarantee, if you don't like your title, you can swap it out for a new one. No problem. New book. book. Don't like it? Get a new book. For free. So, really though, I listen to Audible in the car all the time. It's really the only time I get a chance to, because I go home and play Destiny. And sometimes I listen to it while I'm playing Destiny. Uh, It's just so satisfying to be able to have right there on your phone everywhere I go, which is the only source of any media pretty much in my life. Uh, I've been recently listening to Aziz Ansari's uh, book about uh, modern modern romance is what it's called. And it's really entertaining. And he reads it himself. And he like clearly throws in his own little little <laughs> bits that he didn't write down the first time he wrote it. And it's it's insanely entertaining to hear him just almost do half stand up while you're listening to a really interesting uh, topic. And I, it's just such a good listen. And it's so nice to just have 30 minutes in the car every day. So you can get a free audiobook with a 30 day trial at audible.com slash crucible. C-R-U-C-I-B-L-E. That's Audible.com slash crucible for your free audiobook with a 30 day trial. Go get your free book. And then if you don't like it, get a new book. Go listen. Okay, folks, without any further ado, let's get to this, this interview, interview with our friend Joe Verrated. Love this after guy. A musical break. Musical break. Musical, musical break. Musical break. <laughs> gentlemen second go is our musical guest this week you can go check him out at secondgoaz.bandcamp.com of course if you're a musician of any kind and you'd like to hear your music on the show all you gotta do send us an email crucibleradio at gmail.com everyone welcome back to crucible radio we are here with an exclusive interview uh with a special guest you might know him uh from his uh very classic throwback joke of a psn family guy ostrich <laughs> and always a his classic massive <laughs> the classic elo <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that you might know him from is his enormous, gigantic ELO <laughs> as the number one Trials player on PlayStation after week one of Trials of the Nine. Uh, please welcome to the show a dear friend, Joe Verrated. What's up, guys? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Huge! Did I, did I sell it? Huge. Did I sell it well? Yeah. I kind of oversold it, man. I'm like, 
feel awkward now. <laughs> you do have a you do have a great looking ELO number that means something probably. But we oh, had you on the man. show because you're a friend. You're a friend and a good player. I have to jump in here. Uh, ELO is it's not an acronym. You don't have to spell it out. It's not Electric Light Orchestra. It's a guy's last name. It's ELO. It's it's the the name of the guy who invented it. Fun fact. Oh wow, I actually didn't carry know that. on. Yeah, you sound like the yeah. guy that says GIF. Like anybody knows. GIF. <laughs> okay, sorry. ELO, fine. Word shift. Maybe, maybe sometime mobile. I'll switch. Uh, LO, okay. Anyways, uh, like I was saying, uh, you're you're an all-around great player, a very entertaining streamer to watch, a very helpful guy when it comes to playing Trials. Um, but we always ask people how they kind of got started in Destiny, and you kind of began your rise right around the time we started playing destiny together. So how did that get started? How did you uh, end up, you know, starting a stream and, and playing trials a lot? Well, actually, yeah, that's, um, I wanted to start with, thank you guys for having me on. Um, I remember about a year ago or maybe even more than that. Now, um, you shouted me out on like a growing streamers thing or like up and coming or something like that. It was really cool. And I remember going back and watching it, but I couldn't help but thinking like, man, like, it'd be really cool to be like the main guest on the show. <laughs> like, <laughs> really in the circle, so I really do appreciate you, you having me guys. If of you were course. number two in Ello, uh, we probably wouldn't have had you on. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think crafty actually might've overtaken me cause I hopped off before reset. So uh, it might've gotten me. I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably overrated now. Okay. What a world well, uh, where you have to door, play until 2 a.m. to there. make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a quick interview, not number two. Get out. <laughs> so it goes. Um, so, yeah, t- tell us about the beginning. Sort of how, how did your stream get started? What were your goals and, and what did it turn into? All right, well, classic. I just hit that button on my PS4 controller in like the end of 2015, I think. My brother introduced me to Twitch. So that was really cool. Um, and yeah, we started out just doing what we're doing now. We help people in trials. Um, and it, it grew pretty quickly. We were able to get a computer. We were able to get a mic, like everything like that. And then <laughs> a lot of people from my community will know I kind of just like disappeared off the planet for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> we came back at the end of 2016. And I've just been going like full steam ahead after that. Um, and here we are. Yeah, when we, uh, when we started playing together, I think, I think I remember you were fourth. And it was like back when Murdaro just sat up there at number one for like <laughs> a year and a half. And everyone's like, what? Who's like a thousand who's? behind or ahead of everybody? Else. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> double crafty at number two. And then I forget the rest of the top five. But uh, we we played trials together and it went amazingly fun. I think that was uh back during back when doctrine of passing was was really oh, huge. Man. And That's then I do remember you came up. back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You came back and then you st- still used Doctrine because like mm-hmm. two patches had gone through, but you're like, well, this was on my character and it yeah. kind of just still worked for you. Doctrine, man. I I got it the first weekend that Trials came out and it's classic because I had people come into my chat and be like, oh, wow, like you're using an auto rifle. Like, man, you must be really good. <laughs> like, oh, just you wait. Everybody's going to be using this gun. And little did we know. <laughs> yeah, Bones for sure didn't know. Oh yeah, no. I, let's not talk about my first take on <laughs> Doctor and ever again. That was a hot take. Oh boy, I had a hot take. Um, listeners might remember this story, but um, John Wesniewski was in my Twitch chat, and I said, "Well, auto rifles are still trash after using it oh, like for like no. one game." <laughs> And then, like, that that was when Doctrine immediately became the dominant weapon, and I had said that, and I was like, and I'm never going to live that down. And then you played with me where I get, like, triple downs and trials with one magazine of Doctrine. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Oh, Yuck. man. Missed that again. I mean, it seems like you've always had a, a pretty distinct sort of identity as a player, sort of in, in what loadouts you use, you know, what, what loadouts you stick with. Um mm. I mean, tell us about a bit we use. I mean, I got to I gotta ask about Blink. Oh, man. Blink is the most unique thing I've ever felt in Destiny, and I, I can't not use it. I mean, even in um, Destiny 2, I have zero mobility on my Warlock, and I'm the fastest out of my fire team always. So that allows me to have, like, almost max uh, recovery and um, resiliency. And it's, it's so good. How are you utilizing Blink to be the fastest? Um, you just basically bunny hop, but with Blink, if that makes sense. So like when you spawn in, you just like 
jump and then blink forward and you can do that like several times and it allows you to get to those lanes that like team shotting is so important you get the opening shot and also i mean so many times i'll have to 1v2 or 1v3 and you can pick someone off or run into a hallway and then blink back out and you're behind them and they have no idea you're there you can easily pick them off it's so it's so good blink is the best jump in the game in my opinion yeah, in particular, I, I, I noticed when you play Blink, you use it in ways that don't occur to me, which is like you, you'll come up to a group of people and I'm thinking in terms of a regular jump where you basically just like jump over them and into the thick of them. Um, and I'm thinking like, no, 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 you're, you're going to be, <laughs> they're just going to turn. But there's something about the Blink that's so disorienting that you're, you're a position on the other side of them and they're just like, they're not aware. I just watch you shoot so many people in the back of the head that just don't pick up on it. How does it work? It's yeah, it's disorienting is the perfect word. Um, I, most of the time I'll, I'll bait them into following me and then just blink right back over my head or over their head. So they're looking where I was and then they have to turn all the way around to try to find me. But I'm like, it, it's, it's just super disorienting for the enemy. And then I, with the sidearm that I'm using, it just melts people. So you're using a sidearm. What sidearm are you using? I'm using the last hope and it is very good. Why do you like it? Um, it's got max stability, um, and it's got it's got pretty okay range. You do have to be close, but um, I've been pairing it with a scout just to kind of give my get all my bases covered. You know, like long range, middle sure. range, and short range. Um, but yeah, the last hope I've pulled off many a one v threes and one v twos in the new trials. It's very good. Well, I guess to round it out, I mean, I, I noticed you, you were switching a little bit, fusion, sniper rifle. What, what's your choice for, for power weapon uh, in, in Trials this year? My choice was um, a fusion, just because all of the, uh, all of the power, power weapons that I've tried, just, or all the snipers that I've tried, just didn't feel very good. They didn't feel consistent. I didn't like the way of them. And then I got done with my first Trials card, and I picked up the Trials Sniper, and that thing is fantastic. I didn't switch back the entire card, and I just had a blast. It's got a perk where you can slide to reload, which is perfect because I can just pick someone off and then slide and then have a whole other bullet to finish off the last three if I can't, you know, go for the clip. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you're sliding all the time right, anyways. Might as might well. well reload a gun while I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then I noticed you were rocking Skull of Dire Ahamkara, and... Uh, sure okay i get it but <laughs> but why what i, I mean, mean it seems like there's a lot of other choices even for void walker if you want the honest truth i don't really have any other exotic okay glad we settled that i could be like i could be all cocky and be like oh yeah i mean i'm just i'm just gonna get a quadruple nova every time and then i'll have a halfway to my second nova but no i really don't i want the um i oh, like the Trevor's step I'm probably butchering it. I have no idea what it's called, but it, they're gauntlets that give you health regen every time you melee. And that's yeah, what the I vampire have, ones. That's what I have my eyes out for. I think that would be really nice um, running those. But yeah, the <laughs> the skull of um, Kara or whatever it is. Yeah, that's just the only exotic I have. This is one of the last episodes we'll ever have, we'll, that that's ever going to be a thing. <laughs> every time after this, <laughs> it's like you got to have some exotics, right? But that's that's fair. That's fair. Do you like the Warlock kits in general besides just loving Blink? Uh, everyone seems pretty into Devour. Is that your uh, is that your choice on the Voidwalker? That is my go-to. Um, I mean, even today, I played I played some Hunter, and just 90% of the time, I, I couldn't push when I wanted to because I didn't have any health. But Devour gives you three or four ways to get your health back. It's, it's incredible. I had so many... Um, clutches and trials where you can't you not only can you heal yourself but every kill after that you get your health back which allows me to just like eat my grenade and then just go as hard as i want because i'll get it i'll get my health back with each kill you know mm-hmm. and it's no other class really has that um specifically Voidwalker, where you can um devour your grenade and get all your health back so yeah i that's that's the strongest class in my opinion and we were sort of talking about that last week that like you know, you mentioned earlier, like it's it's team shotting is is so key, and certainly a lot of people are unhappy that it's a lot harder to just go off and and you know do a one v three a one v four successfully. And so, ways that you can gain your health back in the middle of a fight are super duper important. I I can't tell you how many times I um I either 
got in a 1v1 and then they got me lower health and I just eat my grenade and pop right back and they're expecting a weak opponent and then I have full health and I you win every time. Same thing with a, a rift. It's great. So just to round it out then, you'd mentioned you're running zero mobility. So sort of, yeah, what, what, what's your take on mobility, recovery, resilience right now? I, oh man, I actually really like uh, mobility, rec- recovery, and resilience because back in Destiny 1, you'll remember that the supposedly tank subclass, you know, like the biggest armor of them all is the fastest freaking one out there. <laughs> and then, so I really like how they laid out these subclasses where titans you get a lot of resiliency but then you're you're slower you know and then uh hunters you're really quick but then you don't have that much armor or anything like that and then warlocks you get a lot of recovery and it's i I really like the layout that they did especially because with blink you can still be the fastest anyways (laughs) so you're not missing the mobility for for strafe speeds so it's right it's walking speed which includes strafe speed and jump height obviously you can live without that but otherwise you don't mind zero mobility? Not really. Um, primarily because there's so many options to get your health back with um, Voidwalker. You can kind of take that extra time to peek and then just get it all back, you know? I'm going to play some Voidwalker. You need, you need to try it out. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I got to level it up. <laughs> Again, the only time this will happen on the show where it's like, do you have a Warlock level? No, I haven't started it. Yeah, you're right. I still haven't made my Titan. I need to do that. Yeah. After this episode, everyone is expected to have at least most of the things. <laughs> so we already brought up trials uh, and your and your big L.O. Hello. Hello. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, you know, you played a lot of trials in I D1. Did. I was there for a few runs. They were they were great. Uh, and and obviously it's now the hot thing in D2. Let's talk about. The changes. What do you notice? What stands out? I mean, obviously, we know it's fours, new map, and all that. What was the first thing you noticed after a, t- a ticket or two? Um, the main thing is what everybody else is saying is the team shotting. It's mm-hmm. it's huge. You gotta you trials of the nine is much more team oriented than trials of Osiris because those those team shots will just get you killed so quick. And you, if you try to like peek a lane by yourself and there are three other opponents down there, you're going to die. You're not going to make it out of there. I was afraid that it was going to be kind of slow, that the no having no power ammo would suck. But I actually found that you still do get a decent amount of 1v1s. You just got to be you got to be smart about it. You know, you like slide mm-hmm. past a corner, start shooting like while they're while they're caught there and you'll win the gunfight before their teammates can come around the corner and team shot with them. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I'm in love with Trials. I, I actually think I'm having more fun in Trials of the Nine than I did with Trials of Osiris. So how do you create those instances where you, uh, you know, have, have an ability to pick people off? I, I mean, I'm sure Blink has a lot to do with it. It's, it's mostly just picking your battles. Um, you'll, you'll go around a corner, and if there are two or three people, you just got to immediately disengage and go find a different lane, different angle. Maybe try flanking. Flanking, I've found, is a huge way to get kills in Trials of the Nine because in Destiny 2, your radar goes away for like two seconds after you de-scope. So Mm -hmm. you have a lot longer to go behind them and just start picking them off, and they'll have no idea where it's coming from. So it's basically just picking your battles, knowing when uh, to fight and when to fall back, especially with low recovery and all this team shotting going on. How are you incorporating flanking into something that, requires you to be a little bit more team oriented. Uh, um, I feel like I feel like flanking is a little tougher simply because you have to be able to be like, all right guys, I'm gonna go do this. Uh, you guys stay here. Uh, but if you're teaching people on the fly, how are you uh, incorporating flanking? Yeah, mostly flanking is hard to teach. Um, I guess the best way would just be watch watching how I do it or how others do it because how I would do it is I would split up when I was doing triple carries, most of the time I split them up like by them, like all three of them to go over one way and then just try to team shot or like fall back if you're hurt. And then I would sneak around. So they would just like keep their fire and like keep distracting. And then I would come up from behind and just take them all out. So flanking is a hard thing to master because you can instantly, instantly get caught. You know, if you, if you pull up and then they see you on the radar, they're just all going to turn around and team shot you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's very it's a very high risk, high reward. Especially I don't know if you know that on the map Eternity, there was that one spot like 
next to the spawn um, with the more open spawn that was this little platform. You could just get behind him and kill everybody. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like way in the back of the spawn, that, that platform? Uh, on defense? On it, Well, it switches, but the one where you spawn, I guess, outside, more open, and then like... Uh, no, when you're attacking, when you're attacking. When you spawn right, in right, on, right. And on the right, there's that platform. If you're on defense, you can sneak all the way around and then get on that platform. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. all four will have no idea where you are. And it was... That was a good spot. It was an evil spot, but it was a good spot. <laughs> yeah, th- there's nothing like quite as satisfying as like coming around a corner and seeing three yep, people and, they have and no they're idea. all hard scoped and none of them are facing you. It's beautiful. Yeah, I noticed one one piece of communication that you had when you were executing a flank that I think is, it, it, there's, there's probably a lot to this, is that when you were saying, okay, I'm going to go flank, the, the thing you kept saying is like, okay, don't die, get your health. <laughs> like there, there, when you commit to doing the flank, you sort of start the timer for how long it's going to take for you to get around. And that kind of requires your teammates to not fully commit to, to work an angle, to get their health, to have the standoff, but to keep the engagement going long enough for you to get in position. Cause if they all die and you flanked, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really not really useless. a flank anymore. Um, yeah. Staying alive. I think, is one is an, is also another really important part of this trials because of the res timers. You can't pick people up for a long time, and having a three on four advantage with team shotting is huge. Um, so the main thing was just staying alive, wait for me to try and get over there. If I can get a pick, great. If I can't, I'll just fall back. But even the way I saw it was, if you're defending, even if they planted, you will have a much better success rate, like going in and attacking that position, if four of your teammates are alive rather than three. You know, like, so just back off if you like, if you don't have any of them weak or if all of you are weak, just get safe was the main thing I would tell people because like I was on my way to like help them, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you cracked the seal on it, you know, what do you think about having trials as an objective mode, at least this week? How does that change things? I thought it was really fun. Um, I, I mean, Bungie really did listen to everything. They, you switch sides, you switch like objectives. It seemed like like there were, there was sort of another level of decision making on like the if you're attacking like you know which side do you go to initially sure you know where are you planning on planting it but then depending on what happens maybe you move to plant on the other side maybe you hold off on planting it if you know that you know there's a good chance that they'll defuse it I mean were you starting to come up with with sort of like a, a framework like a strategy mm-hmm. for the right way to attack in in countdown yeah my my the strategy that worked best for me um was basically rush planting um you go i would always go to temple to the the right side that's more open for one you can um, team shot better because it's more open and they can't really hide and it's it's so great because when you're when the bomb is planted you can essentially just run you can bait them into like as long as you stay alive, when if they try to defuse, you can just go back and kill them. You know, so I have a lot of hilarious plays or <laughs> hilarious where I'm telling like the people I'm helping, like, yo, just run around in circles, like don't let them near you, and then they have to make a decision: <laughs> either go try and defuse and like get shot, or they have to push and then lose. And it was so funny. I just kept telling people like it's all about baiting. Just like if you wait out the time, like the bomb's gonna explode and we win the round regardless. You don't need to kill them. So. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed the extra take instead of just like a, an elimination t- elimination style. So, okay, so let's say, let's say you you plant the bomb. All four go to temple. It, it's early; like they clearly all went to keyhole. Yeah. It's four v four, and you've got the bomb planted. Well, let's say let's say all four of you are alive. I guess I'm I'm sort of wondering where's the tipping point, like. When do you say, okay, we need to kind of hole up here, defend it, see if we can get them to make a mistake versus we got a pick or maybe we got two picks. What does it take to say, all right, let's just go kill them. There's no chance they're going to defuse this. Um, Yeah. Essentially, if we get enough picks, if they're, um, if there's only a lot of the time when we would be attacking, you can read what they're doing by the radar. So if there's, two people flanking, well, four beats two. So most of the time I'm like, all right, everybody just turn around and push this tunnel with me. And like, you're going to win. A, even if you, even if one of you dies, it's still a, it's still a win because it's three B three B two instead of three B four. So there, there definitely are tipping points, but I, I really didn't find myself going keyhole was 
stressful for me. I, I didn't like Keyhole. <laughs> it was very, it was more open. So you could, I could just run away and then they'd have to go to fuse and I could snipe in the face, you know, Keyhole, if you run away, it's harder to get an angle because of those walls. Um, so yeah, I, I mostly just stuck outside next to my temple. <laughs> what about the fact that if, if you're, let's say you're defending and everyone dies, you still get the win, right? Cause they didn't yep. plant it. Did that, did that factor into your decision making at all? Like knowing that you could you could take a little bit more of a risk and go for maybe a trade instead of just a kill? Oh, definitely. And that's actually I, I picked up on that. If you're, I, I really like this too because instead of tying the round, someone always wins. So yeah, even if uh, if it's a one v one and it's um, like and you're on defense, if they don't plant, they lose. Or if you if you don't like kill one of them, you lose. So. I traded a lot of times, but because we were defending, we still won the round. And I found that was like huge because it changes your decision making. I, I, if you mm-hmm. have like a Nova or something, be like, all right, well, I can just ape this. Even if I die, we win the round, you know? Um, and yeah, the, the, the baiting, I, I have some hilarious plays where I, I literally just ran in circles by the power ammo trying to not die and then would just kill them when they were defusing. And then another person would go try and defuse and I just do it two more times. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned power ammo. I want to talk about that a little bit because I was kind of with you uh, in that first thought of like, all right, maybe power ammo doesn't come into play that much unless you're really trying to go get it. Yeah. But after a couple tickets, it really feels like it did. Uh, did you do any specific things to control power ammo or just try to get it when you happen to be there? How did it kind of factor into your strategy? Um, it's very, it's very situational. Um, a lot of the times, if the other team rush planted like Keyhole, you, you literally don't have time to get power ammo. I found a lot of the times, I, like I'd send my three people over to the other side and I'd be waiting for power ammo, like seven seconds, two of them die. So even if I have like a sniper and it's a 2v4, it's really hard to push in there and take all of them down and still defuse it, you know? So it's just, mm-hmm. it's just literally better to go in with your Mida or your scout and like try to team shot with the remaining people. Um, but that being said, you could also, if you rush planted, uh, like Temple, there was time to pick it up and then kind of like set up your your defense. So it's it's very situational. I I ended I ended up really liking it because it 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 does add a different sense to trials where you really do have to work more with your teammates. And then if you get power ammo, sure you can kind of go off and do your own thing. But um, I, I I liked the new the new system. I was afraid I wouldn't, but I I, I ended up liking mm-hmm. it how do you think supers play differently in D2? Like, I mean, in, in D1 trials, like keeping track of supers, seeing when they were used and keeping track of, you know, like what subclass people were running, um, obviously is a big part of the decision making each round. Um, did you feel like supers played as big a role in D2 trials? Uh, definitely. If anything, they play like a bigger part in it. Um, we had, we were up four Oh or five Oh and, they just use the super every round. Um, and especially with one of those picks being so important to get a three, four, that's, that's really all you need to do to get an advantage. Um, and then you don't get it every, I mean, I've gotten like three supers in a trials match in the, in destiny one before this time you're, you're very lucky if you get two, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I like it. It's, I really like what they did with telling you when they have it and like what's and what's what, and like when they have it and when it's going, I thought that was a really cool feature because it's it's helpful for people that do trials help as well because then you know like what's going on and who has what and then if they use it you tell them like everybody run like go hide. Um, but yeah, I I like the new trials or the new um, super usage that is. I am sensing a theme that you like new trials. <laughs> I, do, I, I do. I do like it. <laughs> he played just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the first day. I, I like looked over and I was like, oh, I've been going for nine hours. Like that's, that's a long time. And I looked over again and it was like 15 hours. Like, oh, I need to sleep. That's, sleep is the thing that needs to happen. <laughs> Turns out you like trials. There's kind of a nice combination just uh, about supers again uh, that plays in with the cooldown times, but also with countdown itself is because you get nothing from sitting in the back. Right. Like, and people are talking about passive play styles, but if we remember that you could, you know, you didn't really have to do anything for two minutes if you truly didn't want to. And it was like, let's get our supers in round three instead of 
uh, round four or five. And, and now with the cooldowns and the capture point telling you to get to the middle or yeah, else yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really nice paced game. And, and that just really kind of adds to the excitement that every round is going to be fast and every round is going to be down to the wire kind of thing. Yeah. What I, um, what I forgot to say was um, energy weapons do a lot of damage to supers and they, I think they, they really balanced um, supers being very powerful, but also you having a chance to kill them, you know, like <clears throat> you can team shot these supers with your energy web. Like, you'll notice that too. When I, if you watch my stream, you'll notice when they pop a super, I'm just instantly, everybody pull out your energy weapons and just team shot it. Cause it really does kill them. Like I, you, you can um, kill a super with like one magazine of a sidearm. Like if they get close enough, <laughs> it's, it's so like, they're really powerful, but then they they also have a weakness, especially if you, use that elemental energy on the super. So if you have like an arc uh, auto rifle, it's going to melt a striker, you know? And it's, I think that's a cool feature that they added. Oh, you got me thinking about this now. I mean, I, I think already just sort of in, in, in terms of the weapons that are available, there's a tendency to have a longer range kinetic weapon and a closer range energy weapon, whether that's an auto, an SMG, a sidearm, whatever. But as more guns come out, you know, maybe there's going to be a, a really phenomenal, you know, energy scout rifle and you want to switch to something closer range and primary. Do you see yourself having a tendency towards a closer range energy weapon choice specifically to to deal with that melting down a roaming super that's closing in on you? Yeah, I, I that's a good point. Um, I haven't really noticed any long range energy weapons. I, I think I saw like a sky burners or something like that but that's pretty much the only thing i've seen so yeah i I think the common thing to do right now is a kinetic long range and then a short range um energy weapon i hadn't thought about that either good idea birds you know (laughs) very insightful um (laughs) i got a question after angry okay just first weekend everyone's still figuring it out were there any strategies that you went up against where you thought at the same time one that is never a strategy I would attempt. That's not me, not my style, not my team, whatever. But also that works really well or works really well against the way we're playing. Um, not, not necessarily. There was, uh, there was a, like, like three strategies that people would really like um, switch between where they would like two would flank or they would all post up somewhere or they would all rush somewhere. And you can you would really just kind of figure out what they're doing that round and just work around it. Now, if you go against like top tier players, then that's going to be a different story. I played freaking Wish this weekend, and that was that was fun. Um, <laughs> they they did something I hadn't seen yet though, which was throwing knives. So they they were rocking scouts and then hand cannons, which I thought was weird until I ran into their throwing knives. So they'll they'll get, they'll slide behind a corner, hit you with that throwing knife, and then two tap you. So I guess that strategy right there was, I mean, like, I just kind of put my controller down and be like, wow, I mean, good job. <laughs> like, I pulled out my sidearm and I was ready to melt him and I just exploded. So that was, I think throwing knives are very um, underrated when it comes to, like, close encounters. Oh, I can't wait to keep finding out stuff like that over the coming weeks. There's so much we don't know. Right? There's so many guns we don't know, too. Like, there's so yeah. many things coming out on Twitter where the people are like, yo, this, this auto rifle is ridiculous. Like, you've got to try it out. It's fun. And I'm like, wait, what is that? Right? And you're like, wait, <laughs> do I have do that? Get, do, do I have that? that? I probably deleted yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, every time I delete something, I'm like, oh. Um, right? I can get <laughs> it again, I'm sure. Or it'll yeah, just it'll end come up like back. me and have like 200 things in your vault because you're afraid something's going to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of space, man. That's true. That. <laughs> All right, Joey. What would you say would be the biggest mistakes you saw teams doing? And it, for that fact, what were your biggest mistakes? Um, the most, or the biggest mistakes I saw people make were going into a fight that they shouldn't have gotten into. Um, I've seen a lot of people like tweet and like talk about scouts being overpowered and that they kill you too fast. But I mean, most of the time, if you watch them, they're I mean, they're in the open with no place to hide. You know, so it's not really the scouts' fault. It's it's your positioning that's the problem. Especially with if if four people shoot you once with a scout, you're gonna die like instantly. So uh, my guess would be, or my the biggest mistake I think they make is 
not getting their health back before they engage. I had a lot of people think that they can just like stay in the firefight when they're weak, when they, they really just need to hop back behind a corner, get their health back before they decide to, to try and yeah. team again. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't uh, factor their recovery into yeah, yeah. And like that, gunfights. And honestly, that's probably my mistake too, because I, I mean, you're, it's in the back of your head. You got that little voice telling you, oh, you can totally peek and get two more scout shots. Like you totally <laughs> can. And then you peek a corner and die. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But yeah, it's, it's mostly just being aware um, of your health and like when and when not to peek or when and not, when not to push. So that's like that, that, that's a pretty strongly individual th- mistake that people make and, and tip. Do you have any advice for teams? Like, let's say you, you know, you're the lucky boy who gets designated. Sorry, let me say it again. Let's say you're the lucky person who gets designated the shot caller on your team. <laughs> no, no, we're not, we're leaving that in. <laughs> He's a lucky Look, I'm boy. just trying to be inclusive. A lot of people play <laughs> Destiny. <lucky> you <laughs> want to win Let's just my say, rifles, you got to be a lucky boy. <laughs> Crucible Radio, the podcast for fancy little boys everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, love how, I love how each one of us like giggled before we all busted out laughing. <sighs> oh, that was great. Luck be a little boy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Andrew, I know you have to leave it in, but just like... Nope. Uh, yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, what was your question? Yeah. Not about boys. <laughs> okay. So let's say you're the shot caller on your team and you're going into trials. You are not, you know, the 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 four best players in the world. You don't have incredible gun skill. You know, you, you can talk to each other, you know each other, but you're not able to make it flawless. What advice would you give for for teams or specifically for the person calling the play uh, that can maybe give them an edge and, and eke out that win? Um, one would be getting a strategy and like sticking to it. Um, I found myself going temple pretty much every round and you get, you get more and more comfortable with that. You, you learn the lanes like perfectly and you even start to guess what they're going to do. And then nine out of 10 times your guess is right. Like you get someone weak and I would like run even further to the left. Cause I think they're going to be behind that left pillar. And then they are, and you can get a pick that way. Um, I mean, same thing goes with the right. If you if you go on the right side with, with your buddy, like get used to playing with that buddy, you'll know where he'll be looking and you can just like team that corner each time. And if you get him weak, you can push up or fall back. And it's it's mostly just learning who you're playing with and getting those th- those first picks together because team shotting is so important. And that's, that's what's really fun too because I get – a set of new people every seven games, you know? So I have to kind of learn how they play, learn what supers they are, learn what guns they're using and kind of work, work my own way around that so that we can be successful. I know I definitely feel some pressure. Like if you try a plan and it doesn't work, like feeling obligated to try something different, like, Oh, we went to temple last time. It didn't work. Let's go to keyhole this time. But you're saying no better just to come up with one good one and stick with it. Yeah. Most, because if you think about it, if, if um, <clears throat> three people went temple or three of the enemies went temple and only two of you went temple, well then like, yeah, you're going to get outshot. You're going to play, or maybe they got there faster than you. Maybe if you got there faster and like got the opening pit or got the opening shot, then that, that team fight could have gone a different way, you know? So just that's, it's a weird suggestion, but I just found myself getting really comfortable on that left side. You know what I mean? So maybe finding something that they get really comfortable with or just, and I found that doing it over and over again kind of made made it really comfortable for me. So that would just probably be my best advice to to learn learn the lanes and learn where they go or where the opponents go, and then just getting in that habit. Very well said. Gracias. You're welcome. <laughs> De nada. Well, Joey, dude, thank you so much uh, for these tips. This has been a really awesome interview. Uh, And thank you for spending a little time with us. If people want to come check out this beautiful stream of yours and uh, maybe learn a few more things, where can people find you on the internet? Um, The main place you can find me is right on Twitch. It's uh, Joe overrated spelled J and then overrated Um, trials pretty much all weekend. Um, Twitch and YouTube would be the, I mean, uh, Twitter and YouTube would be the next places. Um, I haven't really done much with YouTube, but I plan to plan. I, I'm uploading something soon, like first week of trial trials highlights, which should be pretty fun. And then um, Twitter, I'm pretty active on that. So those those three are the main main places. So yeah, if you ever need trials help, 
Come on down. From the number one <laughs> trial <laughs> superstar. <laughs> number one trials boy. That was that was yeah. that was oh, that was really fun. I think we too. have to call this episode number one trials boy. Right? I think that's, so. That's uh, that was yeah. really fun about um Elo too is because I mean it's so early on it's not really getting cheesed yet, you know. It's it's still like you know in Destiny One people would make a bunch of accounts or they'd like do account recoveries. Like th- these first couple weeks are very true to like who is actually playing and who's actually getting this Elo. So it's not mm-hmm. really like a a legitimate stat right now. So it's fun to like to chase it, you know? I like it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was a fun chat. Everybody go check them out. Twitch.tv slash overrated. <laughs> nice talking with you, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. This is this is a ton of fun. I really appreciate the the invite. Anytime. We'll, we'll all have to do a, an overrated Crucible radio card soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool radio, that works. Radio, yeah. So we can do sure. all four of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're going to start demanding that every single one of our guests carry us flawless every week. (laughs) Hey! Or else we don't put out the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a plan. So what does the announcer normally say at the end of the show? Yeah, the slow music. It's usually the standing the and waving on stage. Thank you guys. I had so much fun. Shout out to Lauren. Shout out to this amazing cast. This was the best week of my life. Thank you, Crucible Radio, uh, for being a show that I host. Seriously, I will never forget this. Have a good night. And then, then comes the uh, the waving, the uh, looking around to find somebody to talk to, but it's got to be so loud. You can't really hear each other. And, the awkward just hug. hug Andy oh, Samberg. everyone's got to hug Andy Samberg. There's always like the short arm over Bobby Moore's hand. And then there's shoulders. like the one, like the bassist from the band who's just got his hands in his pockets looking kind of awkward because he didn't prep for end of show <laughs> just like us. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yep. Go to crucibleradio.com slash giveaway. Follow us on Twitter. Twitter.com. <laughs> yeah, go to twitter.com. Check it's it out. Great if you haven't heard about it. Join join the Discord, discord.gg slash crucible radio. Lots of people in there. <laughs> .gg <laughs> is looking for games. Uh, join the clans. Faction wars are coming up. You want to be on the right side. Swing in orbit, of course. I think that's it. I'm going to go eat pizza! Pizza time! (laughs) And Twitter! What's up, everyone? Bones here. Do you like podcasts? Do you like chill conversation? Well, me and my co-hosts Swain and Birds put out a bonus podcast every month on Patreon. If you want to check it out and be a part of more awesome stuff, head over to patreon.com crucibleradio and join the squad. See you there.